My guest today is Dr. Tom Schreiner, well-known and well-loved author, teacher, and New Testament scholar. Tom has published many influential books, including several great commentaries. He's always nuanced, thoughtful, and balanced, as you'll see in this very enjoyable conversation. Cars, coffee, theology. Okay, so welcome. Well, oh, I mean, Glad thank you, thank you. It's welcome, so good to you're be welcoming here. me too. I see how you are. Uh, you are probably a rare guest in that I've known this about you for a long time. You don't like coffee. Right? I don't like coffee. Okay, nor does your son, which my former student. Right, right. But there is something you said you do like. What was it? Uh, mint green tea at Starbucks, I okay. do like. All right, we can do that. We can definitely do that. So a question I always like to ask people is, what was your first car? My first car that I remember that I owned was a Super Beetle. What is a Super Beetle? Well, it, 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 it's, a, it's the Volkswagen, right? Uh, but they called it not just a Beetle, but a Super Beetle. Now, why, why was it why was it called a Super Beetle? I don't remember. I'm not a car person. Right. Okay. But actually, my brother bought it as a brand new car. Wow. And he got in, in two or three wrecks and got tickets. He had to get rid of the car because he had to get rid of all insurance, uh, and therefore I got the car. Nice. <laughs> and we had it for years. We had it until. I mean, um, but you, you like you bought it from him, or is yeah. your parents had bought it? I, I, well, my parents bought it for me. Okay. And we, 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 Diane and I had it, and that was before I was married. We had it until we had Patrick, who was our second son, okay. and then we decided we needed more room with right, two, right. two children and a beetle. It's a, that was pretty cool. Really? Do I remember seeing an old picture of you guys having a um, VW oh, van as that, well? That's what we bought next. The so you went so, from the bugs so the we went, so we went, the we, we stayed in the Volkswagen family. We we went from the, the the Super Beetle to the to the van, and that van had for for a Volkswagen that I don't know enough about cars to give you specs, but it had power. Right? Did it? It, it was a. In that V6, way, it was a good car. Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know either. either. Okay. Yeah. So what are you, what are, what are you working on most recently? So First Corinthians commentary just came out. And, Is that right? And yeah, and my revelation. Although the revelation oh. commentary I actually wrote four or five years ago, but it was in this twelve-volume commentary series coming out from Crossway. So, you okay. know, it had I had to wait for, you know, for second Peter and Jude and first oh, second and third. Releasing them all at once. Yeah. Oh. So it's 12 it's so it, it's it's a, it's a popular commentary. Yeah, that's great. I have maybe 10 footnotes in it. Wow. Yeah. That's actually quite fun to write. Yeah, well, I t Jim Hamilton asked me to write it and right. I said if I don't have to do any footnotes. Yeah, totally. And you had preached the revelation around the same time. And I've it? taught it several times and Right, right. Hey, uh, one second. The mint green tea. What size? Grande. Large. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Large or grande? Which is it? I don't. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. We need a grande mint green tea. But right now, I'm. I just sent to InterVarsity a, a, a really light revision of my Pauline theology. Okay. It, but what I mean by light is I carefully look, looked at it two more times and added more literature, but it's more just uh, exposition of Paul. It's okay. not really an exposition of scholarship. Right, right. And, and, and then since then, my big project has been, I'm at the age where everything's being revised. Yeah, yeah. I'm revising first, second Peter and Jude. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Because that series, the next series. It's being rebooted. It's right. the Christian standard commentary series. That's the one I'm doing. John you, in. Yep. And Peter's and uh, Patrick's doing X. Patrick's doing X. Right. Yeah. And so you're just oh good, you're not getting kicked out. I'm That's not getting kicked feeling. out. I know. Most of the people just get kicked out of that thing. So yeah, yeah, That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. I'm really happy, and I've well, already. It'd be fun to have a father and son. I bet there aren't too many commentary series that have a father and a son. I never thought of that. That's yeah. pretty cool. Oh, do you want hot? Was it hot to you? Yeah, this is hot. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I, I, didn't, didn't, I assumed it was an ice tea, but I don't know. Oh, wow, they put that in. They're going to work, yeah, they really filled Ouch. it up. You can put it in here. i got to put it. I don't have it on. It's probably going to be a little, uh, well, that's what you get for drinking tea. Yeah. <laughs>
Another passage that's really interested me is 1 Peter 3. Uh, they call the wives to submit. Yeah. And what's sort of precipitated my interest is the Me Too movement. Right. Okay. Because, you know, when I first wrote it, I wasn't thinking much at all about abuse of women. Right, but that kind of gives a new social context for our reading of those texts. Right, right, and there's been a Without lot. Without a word, not rebelling back or, you know, yeah, wow. That's but good. a lot of, actually, there have been a lot of interesting feminist articles on that passage that I've Read. learned from. Yeah, that's great. I, I don't agree with everything, but I've, I've, I've learned Helpful from them. And, 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 and of course, there's a spectrum. Some. Some argue we should just throw away what Peter says, but uh, others argue, and I, I think this is right, that when, when you read Peter carefully, it's really pretty nuanced. Uh, Peter, uh, Plutarch says uh, that a wife should, I'm paraphrasing, a wife should in all things follow the religion of her husband. Hmm. But Peter doesn't agree with that. Right. I mean, clearly, he's calling upon these Christian wives to be Christians with right. non-believing husbands. Yeah, I see. So there is a, huh. there, it, it's, it's like more empowering to women than maybe right. stoicism or other things. Or and, and, and there's a subversion in the passage yeah, yeah. already. Right. Right. A subversion of the cultural standard because I think we tend to read the passage and think, well, that's a, that's a very conservative passage. But I think Peter's contemporaries would have read that passage and said, that's, that's surprising. Right, the, right. The, 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 the wife has an independent status as a, as a woman to follow Christ. Right. And, and not to do what her husband would probably prefer. Right. What Peter does, no, no exhortations to masters, one verse for husbands. Peter focuses on slaves, wives, citizens who submit to governing authority. He focuses on the person who is under authority and more liable to be oppressed. Mm -hmm. And encourages them. And he encourages right. them and says, look, that's how Christ lived. Right. Christ is our, our example. He, he was also oppressed. Your, your identity is in him, but your calling as a disciple is the same calling as your Lord. Uh, obviously, there are differences. Right. Peter features the distinctiveness of Jesus' atoning death. And yet, I, and, and this has been pointed out by many people, almost everywhere in the New Testament, I'm sure you've seen this, where Christ's atonement for sins is featured, there's also an exemplary thing. Thank you. They're, had, they're, had they're, made exemplar, absolutely. They're tied together absolutely. almost every time. Yep. So that's that's quite fascinating because as evangelicals, sometimes we've focused on the atonement, rightly so, but to the neglect of the exemplary thing. Yeah. And, they're, and, and, and the fascinating thing is to see how they're tied together. Yeah, absolutely. So. Totally agree. I mean, yeah. I, uh, you know, that's been a big part of my yeah. concern as a New Testament scholar is emphasizing the virtue formative element of the Christian faith and the, the gospel itself. Yeah. yeah, well, I loved I loved your Sermon on the Mount book. That was a great, helpful, but shaping book for me. I, I just, well. Enough said, that's all we need to say then. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having you on. That's what we were, <laughs> that's what we we're trying to get to. And now, stop the recording. We got it. And now a book that's very similar to yours. I, I forget the title Jeff now. Dryden. What's, what's the title of that book? Uh, Hermeneutic, uh, Hermeneutics of wisdom. wisdom? A Hermeneutic of Wisdom. I something like that. Yeah. And but, the subtitle is something about recovering the formative agency of Scripture, no. which is a great subtitle. I'm yeah. almost done with that book. Good. But that is a, that is a very profound book as well. I agree. And, I totally agree. Easy to blurb. I was very happy to blurb yeah, it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, very much along the same lines of what you did in the yep. Sermon on the Mount. And, yeah. And he footnotes you. Several right. times. So, Spiritual Gifts. So that's another recent book in your production. Yeah. Which I happen to have right here. Okay. Right. All right. All and right. You'll take that and choose a number between 100 and 150. Give me a number between 100 and 73. 50. All right. Turn to page 73. Read a paragraph out of there. See if it makes any sense. 
we see clearly in the following verses, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, that love involves emotions. For love, Paul tells us, is not jealous, and jealousy is an emotion. Love is not provoked and irritated, and irritation is an emotion. Indeed, God commands us to refrain from unrighteous anger, and anger is an emotion. Yes, God gives us commands that relate to our emotions, and he summons us to obey what we cannot obey apart from his grace. Okay, you want to comment on that? Do you remember what the broader context of the argument is? Or? Well, in, in the middle of my discussion on spiritual gifts, it's the way Paul frames the discussion, he has 1 Corinthians 13 in the middle. So I have a section in which I say, this is, this is a very practical book. Um, I have a section in which I say that love is most important. So this, this book, this book is a trade book. Yeah, yeah. I've never Congratulations. Written, I've never written yeah. a trade book. Yeah, and yeah. So Did the crossover, like Amy Grant going from Christian music to pop music. <laughs> well, trade book. I'm sure I'll make as much as Amy Grant has made on <laughs> this sure. book. That's the goal. Well, especially with your singing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I sing this book, if that be, would become my spiritual gift. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I wrote this book. So I am what I call a nuanced cessation. I saw that in there. I was and looking at it. I, I wrote this book. And I wanted to write a book that defended that view, which obviously many people disagree with, but I wanted to write a book on this issue that was charitable right. and loving, because I think one of the things that's true in our evangelical circles, but in our culture at large, is the ability to have loving conversations where we disagree. I mean, it's our whole cultural context today. It's right. crazy. Very polarized now. Yeah. Um, so I dedicated this book to John Piper, mm -hmm. Sam Storms, and Wayne Grudem. Those, those three men are good friends of mine, especially John, but Wayne, Wayne and Sam as well, and they're continuationists. They, I, I would say, they passionately disagree with me. <laughs> they're passionate people. Right, right. So I wanted to say, can we, can we talk about things like this and in which we disagree in a friendly way. And I say right at the beginning, this is, this is not a make or break issue for me. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Maybe they're right. It seemed to me in my, my very limited circles that almost everyone I talked to thought any kind of cessationist position was kind of, not crazy, but Unlikely. So I thought, I don't think it's that unlikely, and I lean that way, and so I wanted to uh, write a defense of it. So at ETS this year, uh, Lake Duncan and I are going to have a conversation with um, Sam Storms and Andrew okay, Wilson. Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's so, really great. I'm sure that'll be very kind, and because you guys are all good men. I don't know Andrew Wilson, but uh, well, yeah. and Andrew's. Do you know his name at all? I don't. Andrew's think I do. a charismatic pastor okay. in England. Okay. Good Great. guy. He, he just wrote his dissertation on the warning passages in 1 Corinthians, published in Boont. Great. Uh, I okay. just finished it. A great book. Yeah, that's great. So I think very highly of Andy. Yeah, and I hope we can model a, a, a friendly conversation yeah, sure where um, we can talk about these issues. You don't do and you're conscious of not doing the typically really poor argument for cessationism. First Corinthians 13, the proof will come. And I was thankful to see that you don't go down that road. Yeah. And then to see, and in the next chapter, I believe it is, you make a different kind of argument, which is much more nuanced and gracious, which is who you are, brother. I mean, you're a beautiful person and you are nuanced and gracious and thoughtful. And so it, it is that, even though I don't think I agree with you either yeah. on these yeah. things, but I was- Heaven for fend. Yeah. No. I <laughs> walk home. But, uh, yeah, I just, you know, although I have to say that in glancing through that chapter, I thought, okay, at least this is a more, a much more thoughtful argument for cessationism kind of pragmatically and theologically than I remember seeing, you know. Yeah, it's not, it's certainly not a um, open and shut case because I would argue again, that my case is built on exegesis and experience. Mm -hmm. And one of my arguments is, 
perhaps I'm wrong on this, I'm happy to be instructed, but I think contemporary continuationists redefine the gifts to fit our present experience. Mm. That I could be mistaken. Yeah, but yeah. I don't I don't think they're quite the same thing as we find in the New Testament. I guess so, part of your argument is that it's like like tongues, we'll take tongues example. That's you see it as languages for sure. Yes. But my the but tongues t I mean honestly tongues isn't a big issue for me in this book. The, what drives me more is the prophecy uh, argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prophecy is more important to me. Is prophecy in the New Testament, contrary to the Old Testament, fallible, as Grudem and others so argue? Grudem's old argument on that. Yeah, which, you know, virtually all the charismatics I know, they embrace Grudem. Yeah, yeah. He, well, it makes for a way to understand the experience and the text. Yeah, I mean, you're right, right. absolutely right. Right, whereas I argue that the experience Grudem is speaking of we, we all have today, I would call that experience impressions. We, God impresses things upon us, and those can be legitimate, and they can, God, they, they may be. be called prophecy, you should reserve it. But it should not be called prophecy, I argue. C.H. Spurgeon was a cessationist, but one time when he was preaching, he looked up in the balcony, and he pointed to a person, and he said something like, you stole the pair of gloves. <laughs> and the guy did. Right, right. And uh, he, he became yeah, a Was believer. he in the regular habit of calling out all kinds of people? Most of the time he was in wrong, and that time he just got it right. No. You stole this. You stole this. No. Yeah, this right. was like a unique instance. This wasn't what, a regular habit. For that, that was a unique instance. Yeah, and he didn't say, that worked great. I'll try it again next Sunday. <laughs> you stole something. I'm sensing that someone stole something in this room. Raise your hand if you feel convicted. Right, right. right. Edwards, so Edwards thought a lot about these things because he saw a lot sure, of experience. Of course, right, yeah. And Edwards was a cessationist as well, but he believed in impressions. But I think Edwards very wisely said, but you cannot base your life on impressions or try to live on the basis of them. And now I'm paraphrasing Edwards in contemporary idiom, or you'll become wacko. <laughs> I, th I think I think Edwards says you'll become like a jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> is that what he says? Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> but I think so what that, he basically that means. Changed. And, <laughs> now it's a jack o' lantern. Yeah, that's really I mean, funny. Edwards would never say wacko even if he were alive today. Right, right. But I mean that's the danger. Yeah, yeah. So, but at least experientially, I'm not throwing out what Grudem sees. It's just what do we call it? And, and similarly, if I gathered um, tongues, again, maybe qualify this if I'm wrong, but it, if I understand what you're saying, you recognize there might be something that is tongues that's a, would you call it an utterance or an ex, you know, I don't know what you call it, you call it some kind of utterance, but that's different than tongues more technically as a language. Is that right? I would, yes. Similar nuance. I, I pick up on what Packer says that contemporary tongues aren't quite the same thing as this spiritual gift in biblical times, but I don't mean to be offensive to charismatics because sometimes they are offended when I say this, but I'm that it's, Packer says it's kind of a form of psychological relaxation. He says it's sort of like singing scat. But, <laughs> but, but, so you're, but, but you're acknowledging, you're saying there is some kind of utterance that isn't necessarily bad or wrong. It's like not, I'm not saying it's, it's, just, it's demonic. It's not tongues, per se. Be because there are streams out there that oh, yeah. say it's demonic, right, it's right, evil, right. Um, charismatics are, um, you know, very dangerous. Now, I do want to say, you know, many, there are extreme elements of the charismatic movement, sure. the health wealth movement right, right. and all that, that, that is dangerous. Right. But I, I'm talking about mainstream evangelical charismatics. So in, in both those instances, prophecy and tongues, then you're sort of carving out um, a very nuanced, careful position, it seems, that you can acknowledge, again, these things exist. You're not saying they're necessarily wrong. You're just trying to say, let's think carefully about what to label them so as to not create a confusion or extenuated confusion relative to the text. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think the impressions are prophecy, since I, since I would argue that prophecy is infallible. Right. So I don't think there are prophets today. <clears throat> 
I think prophecy has always been viewed as an infallible in the biblical narrative. Sure. So over on your right in the little um, thing, there are some colored envelopes. Uh -huh. You can grab one of those, and in them, you can choose whichever one you want. Okay. I have no idea what's in them. There okay. are some. Ow. <laughs> I can't get You'll see me in court. Yeah. Um, there are various questions. OK. And you can put that, that, that down. Okay. Like yeah. This. Um, various questions, and you will give your answer to it, short answer to it, and I'll also commit to trying to answer the same question. I don't know what's in there either. So. This is cool. What nervous habits do you have? <laughs> you know, someone just told me, I'm going to have to work on this, on this <laughs> that when I lecture, I kind of uh, go from side to side, <laughs> you know? Like doing like the floss. I don't know. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Well, I can't do that, but <laughs> I don't think it's really nervous. But at least it's a habit, it's a habit. that I've gotten into where I, I kind of go. <laughs> this and, and she's, this? No, no. The, it was funny because it was a Sunday school class, and okay. this person was visiting, and she said, um, "Oh, you're the professor who kind of goes." from side to side. Oh my, I'm that's like, the worst, you're in third hand. I right? know, and I'm like, oh, okay, is that the right do that? And I was- Don't worry about 50 books published, <laughs> great father, husband, <laughs> recognized, gracious man. Oh, you're the side to side professor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So it's your turn. Oh, I hate to admit, I bite my nails a lot. And I've noticed that, and I have probably forever, but I've noticed more when I'm Definitely when I'm anxious and or mm. kind of fidgety, like if I'm really needing to concentrate on writing or something, mm. I, I find mm. myself doing that a lot, which I'm not proud of. You know, it's, no. uh, it's somewhat embarrassing, but uh, thanks a lot for asking, Dirk. Right. Uh, I don't think you it's know, a big deal. Yeah. You know, things like free? that. Free? Okay, I'm free? You're free. Oh, Go okay. ahead, keep doing you it. You absolve me? Yeah, yeah. In a good Protestant sense. So, okay. Yeah, we have the screen up between us. Right. Well, I have one. I actually have a button. It comes down. <laughs> so. so anyways, well, this has been great, man. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure to chat with you. Well, thank you. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Three really quick things. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on social media. We'd really appreciate it. Secondly, check out the comment section below. We've put a bunch of program notes and links to interesting things there. And third, check out some of our episodes you can see linked here. Thanks, we'll see you on the road. Peace. <music>